Hi everyone, so welcome to the stream today and welcome to a brand new week as we continue with our discussion for the March 2024 examination and we are starting off the week with one of the fundamental topics in public sector accounting and finance for which we're going to be having a 10 marks question in the exam hall and that is public private partnership. So this is a very important topic in the public sector accounting and finance examination and it is my hope that through this discussion we'll be able to narrow down and understand the key issues that we have to focus on to help us to go into the exam hall and most importantly write the exam and pass the examination so it is for public sector i see some of you guys joining you are welcome give us a thumbs up on the video when you join it helps us a lot but then if there are any questions you have for me you can put them in the comment section or the chat box i'm going to be reading all your questions and also providing you with your re replies as well make sure you share the video as well as reach as many students as possible now for you to be able to get updates on our live streams programs and everything you can uh, follow us on whatsapp so our whatsapp channel it's available you can follow us just search for insurer premium or you can get a link in the description of this video and follow us and that is how you'll be able to get the update so welcome brand new week now we are in week eight for our lectures for the March 2024 examination. So technically we have about five weeks to go for the examination, which means we have the whole of February to wrap up because the exam is on f between 4th and 8th March 2024. So we really gearing up and trying to wrap up and getting ourselves prepared to, for the examination. So welcome, let's see what we can do today in the discussion so let me bring up my screen quickly and let's get excited into our discussion for the day so okay give me a it's like my slide what delay there we go so public private partnership this is a 10 mark question area waiting for you in the exam hall whether i like it or not it is there question four a or b we are going to be seeing public private partnership there question four is with two things 10 mark question on public procurement and the other 10 mark question will come from public private partnership arrangement so we want to look at the first 10 marks area which is the public private partnership arrangement it's an it's an interesting topic i can guarantee you, you're gonna love it it's very simple to understand and once you understand the issues here you can go into the exam hall and answer any question that the examiner is going to be providing you or asking you so what exactly is public private partnership now you know that governments okay has a primary responsibility okay or if you want public sector organizations have primary responsibility the primary responsibility of governments beyond ensuring that there is safety uh, that is national security maintaining law and order and all of those things it's to be able to provide infrastructure facilities okay infrastructure facilities so we need good road network we need better railway lines we need you know better schools all right we need to have various other things water facilities okay we need to have various factories spread across the country to ensure that people are employed and people are working very well at the end of the day we need some network you know capabilities towers and all that to ensure so these are all key infrastructure that is needed to increase the standard of living of the citizens at the end of the day because we need better roads we need better railway we need better schools heck we need some airports you know coming in to ensure that i mean the aviation sector is also working well and other kinds of infrastructure facilities so primarily we pay taxes to the government we government borrows money on behalf of the citizens government receive grants and all that to help to provide some of these infrastructure facilities to enable the or to improve the standard of living of citizens but the thing that you must understand is that say for every one ghana city of tax that you pay 
about 90 percent of that goes into running the machinery of government what does that mean because we have to pay wages and salary there are training there are per diem uh you know uh, the president is traveling somewhere you could see the convoy 35 and 40 fleet of vehicles because they have to launch uh, a certain factory somewhere or there is a certain project somewhere that they have to outdoor or commission and so there are fleets of vehicles and all of those things so for every one gonna see the tax that you pay it's likely that 90 percent goes into just running the machinery of government so it means that about only 10 pesos is left for government to be able to then provide the road the railway the school the water facilities the factories the network the airports and all the other infrastructure facilities needed to increase the standard of living of the citizens now couple with this government will go and borrow money all right so but how much can government borrow government can only borrow so much to finance some of these infrastructure facilities and currently ghana is under imf uh program and we are having problem with a second tranche of money being released it's because a couple of things are not aligning very well because of our debt position as a country so really you realize that if we want to rely on the government to provide the needed infrastructure facilities then <laughs> development will never come in the standard of living of the citizens will never increase and so to solve this menace and this challenge generally then there is a need to bring in the private sector because the private sector is going to be having the funding the private sector is going to be having the technology the private sector may have the technology and the necessary things that are needed to provide these infrastructure facilities it is on this basis why the public private partnership arrangement was introduced by the world bank with support from various other organizations uh other countries to ensure that companies are able to sorry nations are able to have the infrastructure facilities and that is the whole idea about public private partnership arrangement so it is where a public sector organization or if you want the government who we will refer to as the contracting entity okay the contracting entity enters into an arrangement with private sector entities to provide some of these infrastructure facilities that should have been the government's primary role to provide generally that is all about public private partnership arrangement now just an aside it is important for you to understand that sometimes two public entities could also come together to undertake a project that is called public public partnership okay so two public organizations can also come together to execute a project that is important because that way the two public institutions are going to be sharing the risk it enables value for money to be achieved to, to some extent it reduces corruption in awarding of contracts and other things and so there are some benefits that governments get when two public organizations come together and that is public public partnership but our focus really is going to be on when the government enters into our, an arrangement with the private sector i've written public here again with the private sector entities to undertake these projects so what does the private sector bring on board like i said earlier the private sector is going to be bringing on board the funding that we need so sometimes the private sector is coming on board because they have the funding that we need for the projects generally that we want to undertake number two sometimes it's just the technology because sometimes we are bringing the private sector on board not because the government wants money but because there is a technology that the government wants to leverage on so the private sector could come in and we use their technology it could be for our election 
uh, our voters register or database it could be issues in relation to the general database management of the country so we will bring in the private sector to undertake that project or sometimes it could just be looking at their expertise or skills so the private sector brings on board the funding the technology the expertise to assist the public sector entities which is the contracting entity to undertake a project in that regard now the question we then ask ourselves is how does the private sector get paid at the end of the day because one thing you must understand is that public sector organizations primarily exist to maximize the welfare of citizens okay maximize the welfare of citizens that's the goal but you and i know that the private sectors <laughs> they are not there to maximize welfare of any citizens they are there to maximize the wealth of shareholders okay they are there to maximize the wealth of shareholders generally so the two parties have different agenda different goal different objectives so when the private sector is coming in with the funding all the technology all the expertise or the skills to co partner with the government to undertake a project that the government should have undertaken they've they have to be paid so the big question we then ask ourselves is how do they get paid there are three ways that they can be paid the private sector can be paid number one it could be service charges okay service charges so this is where the end users are going to be charged for using the service so it could be a toll on a road somewhere and so when you get there you pay whatever amount up in our part of the world ghana i think the tolls have been cancelled but they are planning on bringing it back up but that is an end user fee or if it is say a housing project then it will be rented and tenants will they will collect the uh, revenue or the rent income and that will be their service fee in that case so that's the first way they get paid the service fees Another way they get paid is through, you know, budget allocation. Because sometimes, not all projects can the private sector charge people for. So because sometimes some of the things are social good, so you cannot charge the end users for it. So in that case, there is going to be budget allocation every year or, or with for a number of years where the private individuals or private sector entities get paid or in some cases it could be a combination of the two it could be the combination of the two what does that mean it means that service charge a little budget allocation a little what does that mean let me give you an example let's say that government wants to reduce um Dire causes of diarrhea and various other health effects that comes from um, feces and others. And so government want to uh, build a lot of public toilets available to the citizens. But then, you know, public toilets in some areas, that's going to cost money. Government doesn't have the money. So government can enter into that arrangement under the public-private partnership arrangement so that the private sector will, entity will come and establish the public toilet now they are going to be charging the end users who are going to be coming to use the public toilet so this is just an example okay i mean those days when we were in the village we go we don't there is nothing like public toilet you want to poop all you do is just go to the bush sometimes dig the ground and then you do your thing there is an a, a nice fresh air that is going to be passing uh around you and it's like oh that's the best enjoyment you've ever had so you go to such an environment okay then you have built a nice public toilet then you are charging people whatever let's say three ghana city or maybe two ghana city for them to come and poop what the heck? I mean, I can go to the bush and do my thing, have a natural air coming in nice for me. I'll feel better coming to use public toilets for three Ghana city or two Ghana city. In some cases, this three Ghana city or two Ghana cities, I could get some few ingredients and I've prepared what we will call here ampesi, like some yam and some, you know, few things and then boom i have a meal with my two city or three city in the village because 
literally you don't buy anything apart from the basic issues that you have basic uh, ingredients that you would want to buy and so how do we then motivate people so that they will still use the public toilet so when the private sector is seeking to charge say three Ghana city governments could step in and say no if you charge three Ghana cities these people are not going to be coming in and so what do we do okay the private sector is going to say okay i'm going to charge one city or maybe one city 50 pesos then the government is going to absorb the remaining through annual budget allocation so that is where both of the scenarios are coming in and that is where the two issues can be possible so how does the private sector get paid the private sector entity gets paid through service charges if it is possible through budget allocation or the two options depending on the type of project that we are undertaking right then the question we ask ourselves is what what are the principles that underline this public private partnership arrangement so say a government entity wants to enter into a project like this so like i said we want to have public toilets across the country across, especially in the uh, rural areas and so we want to bring in a private sector entity who established this public toilet w what are the principles that we have to follow when entering into public private partnership arrangement so there are a couple of key principles that we need to understand when it comes to this issue about public private partnership arrangement the first one is called value for money value for money you see in the public sector one of the fundamental issue is value for money value for money on the uh, I, I, at the end of the day is ensuring that resources are obtained at the least cost and uh, we are utilizing them for the intended purpose so for every ppp project what we are saying here is that it shouldn't cost us more than it should have so it should be competitive generally that is why for most of the public private partnership arrangements unless otherwise not possible government has to open it up so that various private sector entities can bid for the contract that way governments can select the best bid at the competitive price so we can get value for our money and that is the first principle that each ppp project must adhere to if something is done and another entity or another country is paying whatever a 10 million dollars for it but we undertake that same thing and we are paying 12 million dollars that's that's too expensive and sometimes it happens in this part of the world in africa in some of these developing countries because something that indian india would do under public private partnership and it will cost india just an example maybe 40 million dollars under public private partnership a, a, a certain country in ghana would do the same thing and they will say oh it is costing us 60 million when indians pop india population is above a billion like 1.5 billion and the country in question their population could be maybe 30 40 or whatever 50 million so you ask yourself what the heck is going on are we achieving value for money that is the first principle all ppp projects must achieve value for money it means that they must not cost the country as much as possible it should be a reasonable amount that we are paying for that particular contract not only that in every ppp project there are going to be a lot of risks and so the arrangement must table out how risks are going to be allocated so the second principle is risk allocation the principle under risk allocation simply states that or the principle of risk allocation simply states that the party with the requisite skills or expertise should be responsible for the management of specific risks under the ppp project let's take that again the party with the requisite skills or expertise in respect of a specific risk under the ppp arrangement should be required to manage that risk so there are a lot of risks that a ppp project is going to be presenting we have what we call construction risk 
availability risks, maintenance risks, financial risk. All of these are types of risks that we are going to be facing on the PPP project. The contracting entity, the government, will have the requisites or the expertise to manage some of the risk. Then the private sector will also have some expertise to manage some of the other risks, especially when it comes to issues about financing, because primarily the private sector is bringing in the money. Anything that relates to the financial risk, they're going to be the ones to put in place measures to mitigate any impact of the risks. That could be through insurance. Okay, so there are certain PPP projects, it will require that the entity or the private sector to have an insurance backing the deal. So that as the deal goes ahead, if you can't get the money, then probably we can get an insurance to come and pay for the rest so we get our project going as a country. But risk allocation is the second principle that we have to know about. Number three, is ability to pay. Remember I told you that in certain PPP projects, one of the ways that the private sector gets their money back is through service charges. But like I told you earlier, you don't just get up and charge people anyhow. Under the PPP project, it is required that end users' purchasing power or ability to pay must be considered before charging them. So not that, yes, the private sector wants to maximize the wealth of the shareholders. The private sector wants to make money. So in the name of making money, let's leave them to charge any money they want to charge. No. You have to charge, but take into consideration the people's ability to pay. Because remember, if you charge it too high, nobody will come and your capital is gone down. So, you have to be reasonable to consider the people's ability to pay. And so, that is where, if it is not possible to compromise that by the private sector so that the project will be prolonged, then the government can step in to offer some subsidies through the annual budget allocation for the difference. Like the example I gave you earlier in terms of the public toilet. You want to charge me three Ghana City to come and poop? What is wrong with you? I'm in the village somewhere. Come on, I just take a cutlass and dig a hole and I do my thing. I cover it. Nice air blows around me. I feel comfortable. I come back home. Yeah, it's unhealthy. That's to you. In the village, it's healthy. We do it well. We do it nice. So you have to be careful with it. So don't come and say it's unhealthy. We do it well. So it's healthy to us. But so... Government will then come in and say, hey, listen, this, these people cannot pay three Ghana City to poop. Okay, so charge probably one Ghana City or charge 1.5 Ghana City. That is the principle that you must know about ability to pay. When end users are to be charged, the private sector entity must consider their ability to pay before they charge them. Number four. Is going to be the principle in respect of transfer of knowledge. Transfer of knowledge or if you want skills. This is one of the fundamental issues at the end of the day because you see for the most part many of the PPP projects that government undertakes a lot of these will end up bringing in foreign entities foreign investors. So at the end of the day, in the PPP arrangement, it has to be structured in such a way that there will be some knowledge transfer. So there has to be some capacity building for the locals, for the citizens, so that in the future, we can undertake that same project among ourselves, by ourselves, and we didn't have to bring a private person from outside a country uh, resulting into outflow of cash, outflow of capital, which will ultimately affect our foreign exchange as a country. And so it is important that we build into the public-private partnership agreement a plan by the private sector to transfer knowledge, to train people, to build the capacity of the locals to ensure that that knowledge is passed to them so in the future there will be some locals here 
who government can engage for them to execute such contract. That is another key principle that underline the public-private partnership arrangement. The number five, it's going to be local content. This is also another crucial issue that comes in when it comes to the issue about public-private partnership arrangement, and that is local content. What does that mean? Like I told you earlier, many of the PPP projects for the most part in this part of the world will result into bringing in foreign entities, foreign investors into the country. Now, the local content principle is actually a legal framework which states that anything, any input that is needed for the project, which will be available or is available in Ghana, must be procured here in Ghana so that we prevent the outflow of capital because many of these foreign entities when they come they would want to engage their partners their fellow colleagues in their home country and so when that happens something that can be bought here like the inputs that can be bought here the uh, skills that are available here they will not use it because they would want to bring in people from their country so that all the money goes out there to prevent that there is the local content law which mandates all ppp projects and various other uh, activities that once the offer or once the inputs are available locally they must be procured locally what are we doing we are revamping the economy we are increasing our gdp locally we are creating employment and we are preventing outflow of cash which will result into the negative movement in the foreign uh, exchange rate resulting into the further depreciation of the currency so that is the local content principle as well in that case so these are a number of principles that we can talk about generally when it comes to public private partnership arrangement now there are a list of them i'm actually coming in from my book on public sector accounting and finance and so uh, i have a book on public sector accounting and finance so primarily that is where i am coming in from so you see value for money risk allocation ability to pay local content and uh, we are looking at transparency there are other principles there like environmental climate and social st safeguard it is important that the public-private partnership project does not destroy the habitats okay it does not have a negative impact on the environment and where it does there has to be measures in place by the entity or the responsible parties to protect any negative impact on the government operations or government activities Oh, sorry on the environment generally at the end of the day so the principles are a lot we have accountability you know somebody must be held accountable for the contract that has been awarded somebody must be held accountable if something doesn't go in a manner that it is planned someone must be held accountable for every activity that is undertaken under the ppp project so that in case something goes south we can come in and question these people so that that is all oh, these are some of the key principles that guide ppp arrangement and it's a 10 mark area that the examiner can throw at you in the exam hall and it is important for you to understand All right, I see some of you guys joining. You are welcome. We are looking at public-private partnership arrangement. It's a 10-mark area waiting for us in the exam hall under public sector accounting. Done deal. 10 marks area. Very interesting area that you need to know about that you must uh, make sure you understand very well so that you position yourself to pass the examination. If you have any questions, you put it in the chat for me. I will really answer all your questions for you most importantly i want you to make sure that you share the video as well so that we can reach others who will need this key topic to help them to ultimately pass their examination okay so we've looked at what a public private partnership arrangement is 
we've looked at what the private sector is bringing on board we've looked at how they get paid for what they are bringing on board we've looked at the guiding principles for all ppp projects which is a 10 mark area that the examiner is going to be getting excited about the big question we then ask ourselves is what are the types of ppp projects what are the types of ppp projects and this is also another 10 marks area that the examiner it's going to be bringing to you so types of public private partnership now there are about seven types of public private partnership arrangement for the purpose of my presentation i'm going to take them two by two then you see the way they operate and i want you to stay with me here well because like i said it's a done deal area waiting for us in the exam hall number one we're going to be talking about both and bto okay both and bto now what do we mean by both and bto both means we build operate and transfer that is both then bto means build transfer and operate please stay with me they are very simple you're going to understand it now what are these about they are types of ppp so you know a private sector is bringing in something and the public sector is bringing in something but what are they about in either case what happens is that capital is going to be invested by the private entity so capital investment by the private entity in both cases number two in both cases the there is a risk sharing between the two parties between the contracting entity and the public sector the private sector entity in both cases okay so in both cases capital is contributed by the private entity in both cases risk is going to be shared because everybody is bringing in something at the end of the day then number three in both cases the private entity or the private investor is <coughs> allowed to operate the asset for a number of years to recoup their investment okay to operate the asset to recoup investment so for starters these are the three key features we can talk about whether it is build operate transfer or build transfer operate the private investor is bringing in the capital there is going to be risk sharing among between the two parties the private investor and the public sector entity or the contracting entity in both cases the private investor is required to operate the asset for a number of years to recoup their investment in both cases also it's a new asset that we are dealing with it's a new asset it's a new project that we are dealing with generally at the end of the day so what is really the difference between the two the difference is in the name and the way the arrangement is done the first one is you build operate and transfer so here what happens is that under build operate and transfer the private investor builds the asset it's given the right to operate the asset for a given number of years it could be between 25 to 30 years for them to recoup their investment then after that agreed number of years the residual asset is transferred to the contracting entity so transfer of the residual asset occurs at the end of the time agreed for the private investor to operate the asset but under build transfer and operate bto what happens is that immediately the asset is ready transfer is done so the contracting entity will take ownership of the asset then the private entity is given the right 
to maintain uh, to operate the asset for a number of years to recoup their investments that is the idea about the difference between the two so it is in the name and in the structure of how these things are so what are we saying we are saying that here transfer of the residual asset at the end of the agreed term so transfer occurs at the end of the agreed term but under the build transfer and operate immediately the asset is completed transfer is done so transfer of the asset takes place immediately the asset is completed all right then the private sector entity the private sector entity is given the right the right to operate the asset for an agreed period to recoup the investment that is the idea about build operate transfer build transfer and operate very sweet simple straight to the point again in either case capital is contributed by the private entity it's a new asset risk is going to be shared between the contracting entity and the private sector entity the private sector entity is required or will be given the rights to operate the asset for a number of years 25 to 30 or it could be more than that to recoup their investment the distinction between the two is that under both build operate and transfer what happens is that the transfer occurs at the end of the agreed term where after the private entity has recouped its investments and so whatever it left the surplus assets the residual asset is what the government entity or the contracting entity will receive generally at the end of the day and then under the bto transfer occurs immediately at the end of the day that is the idea about that now the trick here sometimes is that you know under the boat it's like still the asset is own under the control of that particular entity uh, of the, the private sector entity but under bto ownership and tr occurs immediately the project is ready so it's no longer yours it is ours we are just giving you rights to operate it so you can get back your money at the end of the day these are the things that you must understand about build operate and transfer as compared to build transfer and operate and that is the first type so two of them but because of the way they are related i bundle them into one okay let's look at the second one any questions you put it in the chat for me and then we can address it number two the second one i want to also bundle up will be mo for mohammed kudus or mosala and then se like say supreme court so more here it's going to be maintain and operate that is more maintain and operate se here is going to be service concession service concession now stay with me stay with me what is the similarities between the two maintain and operate and then service concession in either of these number one we are dealing with an existing asset okay we are dealing with an existing asset so there is already an asset there is already an operation there is already something that is there 
However, that asset is operating at a low productivity level. So there is less productivity level for the end for the entity or the operation or the project in question. So there's an existing asset. It's not that the asset is faulty. It's not that the asset is destroyed it's not that the asset is being used it's there it's being done but there is less productivity there is less efficiency there that's the second thing that we need to understand then we bring in a private sector and here the private sector entity among other things is required to increase the productivity or efficiency of the entity so the private entity is required to increase productivity or if you want efficiency of the entity of the project so whether we are dealing with maintain and operate or service concession it's an existing asset but the asset is not operating to its capacity we are not achieving value for money there is less productivity there that's the second thing the third thing is that the private sector entity is brought in to shake up the system and increase efficiency for us at the end of the day so what is the difference between the two okay the difference between the two is that in mo maintain and operate it's an agency relationship it's an agency relationship what does that mean it means that something that a public sector entity previous was doing now we bring in a private sector entity to come and do it so it's an agency relationship so now the private entity under maintaining operate is now acting as an agent acting on behalf of the government that's all so it's an agency relationship number two is what i said earlier the private entity only operates the asset without any capital investment because you are an agent okay so the private entity only operates the asset without any capital investment because if you're an agent you don't invest so any money that is needed to ensure that the service will be rendered any money that is needed to ensure that productivity is increased any money that is needed for the day-to-day -day running of the affairs of the entity in question will be provided by the government or by the contracting entity and so here there is no sharing of risks because any risks associated with the asset is solely borne by the contracting entity because you're an agent agents don't bear any risk so any risks associated with the assets or if you want project is solely born by the contracting entity and usually this is a short period of time less than five years it's less than five years and so the private entity operates the asset for a fee okay i could have brought that in for a fee so we pay them because they are agents so we pay them to maintain the asset that is the idea about the issue in relation to that that's the idea about that so under maintain and operate it's an agency relationship the private sector entity just comes in and operates the asset for a fee they are not supposed to make any investment they don't make any investment because of that any risks associated with the running of the affairs of the entity will be borne entirely by the government by the contracting entity and it is usually for a short period of time less than five years that is maintain and operate remember like i said it's an existing asset it's an existing project there is less productivity the public 
for the private sector entity is brought in to increase efficiency and productivity. How about service concession? Service concession also, there is an existing asset, like you know already. It is less productive, so we need a private sector entity to come and what? Shake up the system. But here, unlike Mo, where there was, this is an agency relationship, here, it's more than that. So here, the private investor or the private entity is required to both operate the asset as well as introduce capital into the assets to increase everything generally at the end of the day so you don't just operate it you introduce capital so here we see that the private entity is not only the private entity is not only required to operate the asset but also invest capital into the project that's the first thing service concession you bring in some money into the assets the resources that are needed you bring it to us you have to bring in some money into the project very important now because the private investor here it's not only operating but also bringing in some money it means they will also bear some risks so here risk is going to be shared between the contracting entity and the private entity so the risks associated with the project are allocated between the private entity and the contracting entity between the private entity and the contracting entity between the private entity and the contracting entity now so because the private entity is bring in some money they're going to bear some risk then we need to give them more time to recoup their investments S right so it is usually a long period of time and it takes like you know a period of time so it usually covers a long period and that could be more than 25 years also 20 25 30 40 years that is service concession that is service concession and there is an ipsos that governs the way we deal with this that is ipsos 32 recognition of assets under service concession and we'll look at that later on ipsos 32 but that is service concession a typical example of this is what we saw in the PDS, if you are in Ghana, like what we saw in the PDS, there was a time that uh, there was an entity that came out as PDS and uh, they took over the electricity company of Ghana and then they were required to, you know, operate the electricity company of Ghana for a number of years and under the deal, they were supposed to inject some money into the electricity company of Ghana, build the system, increase efficiency and all that, <laughs> only for later on you know came out that the whole deal was not uh what we thought it was i mean the entity they didn't have the capacity to inject the capital that is required to be injected and all the whole deal was shrouded in some level of uh alleged corruption which up to date i don't know where uh the outcome of that whole fiasco has ended but we move that's the idea about service concession and that is the difference between the two so in either case there is an existing asset there is less productivity we need a private investor to come and shake up the system 
but in Mo, it's an agency relationship. And so the private investor only operates it for a fee. And so the private investor doesn't bear any risk. The risk is borne solely by the contracting entity or the government. For that reason, it is usually a short period of time, less than five years. Under service concession, the private investor not only operates it, but is also supposed to inject some capital. For this reason, they are going to be bearing some risk associated with the project. For the fact that they are injecting some money and bearing some risk, we have to give them significant amount of time, 25, 30, 40, or whatever the heck he is, so that they can recoup their investment. So that is the second collection, if you want, uh, in terms of the models of public-private partnership arrangements or the types of public-private partnership arrangement. Please note that, Yes, it can be types of public-private partnership arrangement, but it can also be referred to as models of public-private partnership arrangement. So in case you see models of public-private partnership arrangement, it's the same as the types of public-private partnership arrangement. So four down. How many more to go? Three more to go. Let's go to the third one. And like I said, I'm doing it two by two. So the third one, so the first one was both and bto second one was more and se third one will be boo okay if you remember my boo and then rot boo and rot now these guys have nothing in common like they have nothing in common they are in a different world all by themselves so they have nothing in common but you know just bringing them together for you to understand. So what do we have here? Boo means build, own, and operate. Okay, build, own, and operate. That's boo. Rot means rehabilitate, operate, and transfer. Rehabilitate, operate, and transfer rehabilitate operate and transfer so let's start with the bull like the name suggests the entity builds it they own it and they op they operate it so under bull government gets nothing what does that mean yeah Technically, government gets nothing. A typical example of bull is what you see in one district, one factory. Under one district, one factory, it's a typical example of public-private partnership arrangement under bull. So under one district, one factory, you are running your business or you have a business idea. Okay. You need some money. So here under bull, government... Well, the contracting entity, let, let me put that down there. We can get it down so you get the idea. The contracting entity will provide, you know, support to the private sector. To the private sector entity. Now, what kind of support you may ask? It could be technical support. Okay, it could be technical support. Or financial support so here there is no transfer at the end of anything because nothing ends anywhere there's no transfer at the end of anything because nothing ends anywhere generally under this approach now let's see what we have here this is what we are saying for instance under one district one factory what the, the way the policy works is that you have a business the business is doing well you want to expand it you want to grow the business but you need money now if you should walk directly to the bank and send them and say you want a loan from the bank the bank may slap on you and say hey 40 percent why because the risk associated with your project is very significant so the bank will say 40 percent what's the one uh, one district one factory is doing as a public private partnership project is that you bring your business plan and your proposal to the Ministry of Trade and Industry as well as the uh, Ministry of Special Initiative or whatever the heck at the Office of the President. And they will look at the proposal. Now, if they look at the proposal, they will, uh, they will find out, okay, how many jobs are you going to be created? 
Where is the firm going to be located? What will be the impact of those on our GDP? What will be the impact of your operation on maybe a balance of payment issue? Meaning that like we can export some of the things that you are doing. So there are some KPIs that the government will look at. The Ministry of Trade and Industry and then the Ministry of Special uh, Initiative or whatever the heck at the Office of the Presidency. They're going to look at all that. And then once you meet the criteria for the criteria that the government is looking for for such businesses they now connect you with some of the providers of finance exam bank agriculture development bank uh and other other uh, financial partners under the one district one factory policy and what then happens is that you now able you are now able to get the money at an interest rate below what the commercial banks would have given you so if you had gone you they would have given it to you at 40 percent and that will even be difficult for you to get but if you bring your proposal they study the proposal look at the proposal it meets the various criteria the job how it will impact our economy where it is located how it will impact our balance of payment position as a country generally and the general contribution to the general economy you can get that loan at say whatever 25 percent what happens? It means that you get a reduction in the interest rate by what? 15%. That is going to be paid to the providers of finance through budget allocation. And so if you are somebody who follows Ghana's politics a lot, uh, there are a lot of instances where the Minister of Trade an industry the former minister alan Martin, and even the minister of finance sometimes have mentioned on the floor of parliament how much government has spent in terms of interest grants under the one district one factory so that is the idea about boo so the private investor owns everything and there is no transfer but like i said it's a system put in place so that we can empower the private in, uh, sector to expand in their businesses, start new businesses, create jobs, help to solve the balance of payment challenge, increase our GDP, and increase the standard of living generally of the citizens. So what does government get in return? Government gets the accolades of creating job. Government gets the opportunity to uh, pride itself with the fact that we are exporting some of the produce. And governments get a pride to say that we are able to control the balance of payment position thereby ensuring that the ghana city doesn't depreciate further than it has depreciated that is the idea about boo all right that's boo so let's come to rot rot is rehabilitate operate and transfer again you see in the name everything is there already so rehabilitate what does it mean to rehabilitate rehabilitate means there is something already there that thing is out of operation you come in and revamp it then we allow you to operate it for a number of years to get your money back then give us our thing back because it's always been ours that is rehabilitate operate and transfer so the clue here is that here we have an existing asset or it could be a factory and that existing asset or factory requires a revamp so it's out of operation and requires a revamp so revamp because it has been <coughs> out of operation It's been out of operation. Okay. So what do we do? We bring in a private entity. <coughs> or a private investor. Is allowed. To. Invest capital. To revamp. And operate the asset 
for a number of years to recoup the investment you know they spent some money to recoup the investment and after the expiration of that the residual asset is transferred to the contracting entity okay so after the expiration of the agreed term the residual asset is transferred to the contracting entity that is rehabilitate operate and transfer that is rehabilitate operate and transfer all right any questions you put it in the chat for me very sweet simple straight to the point so like i said unlike the first two where <laughs> they had some relationships this third to boo and rot there is no relationship but you know just bringing them together so you see the way the explanation has to be done generally at the end of the day and so that is number six the last one is the boats that is design build and operate it's a specialized model and again just let me go to my slide for you to see so you can see types of PPPs here so I'm, I'm coming in primarily from my book uh, on page 200 here you can see the explanation the key features uh, some examples of how each of these ones run generally so the boat design build and operate so it's a specialized contract usually where this time around designing and building of the facility are done based on a 10 key basis that is the contractor takes total responsibility for the design and execution of the project now in the previous types the, the previous types that we have identified the design and everything the government knows how to do it and so they just give you the guidelines on what you're supposed to do but in d boats you are going to start everything from scratch as a private investor because you take total control over everything and so because sometimes these are like i said one of specialized projects that the government has no expertise much knowledge in but it's something that probably you have proposed and so they will leave the design building it and they will allow you to operate it for a number of years then at the end of the day the residual asset is transferred to the contracting entity these are the types of public private partnership arrangement or models of public private partnership arrangement any questions that is what we must understand about the types and it's a 10 mark question the examiner can bring to you there are three ways the examiner can ask the question number one is generically ask you he can list some of the methods and ask you to talk about them for the 10 marks number two he can bring some calculations or some issues bring you some scenarios and ask you which of the methods should be used or which of the methods will be appropriate and so the key features that we spoke about will be important for you to determine or advise a contracting entity which ppp method will be appropriate for them so that's the second way then the third way is the examiner can just pick up one of them and ask you a question about it and especially that is where the service concession comes in he has asked the service concession alone about three or four times so that one alone will be picked and then in accordance with ipsas 32 how do we recognize assets under service concession so the examiner has various ways to ask you the questions about the types of the public-private partnership arrangements or the models of the public-private partnership arrangements the key thing is for you to understand and identify the key differences and features of each of them so that when you are asked you're able to write it or when there's a scenario you can suggest that 
this method will be appropriate for this particular contract this method will be appropriate for this particular contract so that is the idea about the types of public private partnership arrangement so let's see i have some comments coming up any questions put it in the chat for me got some comments coming up let's see if i can take some of them quickly yoni said good evening shira good evening oni alan said following from zambia okay thanks for joining us on the stream uh who the heck um ebenezer said following from ghana accra thanks for joining us ebenezer tv what also i got i'm watching augustine said best lecturer in shira premium in shira god continues bless you and keep you amen thanks for the compliment as well uh from the united states of doma ahinkro okay thanks for joining us from doma ahinkro uh please do the do we have types of ppp i think i've already done that um please i didn't the explanation about boat and btu i don't i don't understand that and that the boat is there risk sharing between the private entity and the contracting entity yes definitely there's some level of risk that is going to be shared generally because although like designing building it operating it everything is done by the private investor it's not boo where only one party will bear the risks because the residual assets at the end of the term will transfer to the government will transfer to the contracting entity so certainly there will be some risk sharing are you getting it so yes just like the others there will be risk sharing so technically it means that the only place where we don't share any risk is under boo build operate build own and operate that one the private investor is on their own that's all then under mo that one the private investor doesn't bear any risk it is the contracting entity that bears the entire risk but for the others there is going to be sharing of the risk between the contracting entity and then the private sector entity and these are the things that we must understand any other questions for me let's see what else do i have okay so the heck so that is the idea about that and um i'm gonna be wrapping up around here today and uh god willing wednesday we will meet and then finish this ppp up our key takeaway for the day is the issue in respect of the fact that this is something government enters into with the private sector and the key principles we spoke about value for money risk allocation ability to pay we spoke about local content and we spoke about transfer of knowledge and then the issue about if you want environmental and accountability so those key principles are also key issues that you need to understand because it's that's uh, the 10 mark question that the examiner is going to be asking you that you must know about in the exam hall. then the types of ppp arrangement so that's it about that god willing wednesday at 4 30 p.m we will meet again and wrap up on the public private partnership arrangement we will share some thoughts on ipsas 32 how ipsas 32 give guidelines on service concession and some other minor issues that we have to clear when it comes to dealing with this 10 mark area in the exam hall my goal is to help you to just usher you into the 10 mark question in the exam hall so that you can do something reasonably and be able to pass your examination how do i join your whatsapp group uh, you can send us a message on whatsapp or uh, follow us follow our whatsapp channel you can see the number on the banner there that you are seeing or the scrollers 
below the screen you can still see the number there uh in that regard so if you read what is scrolling below the screen there is a number that zero five zero one one four nine two nine six you can send us a message on whatsapp or you can follow our whatsapp channel because you will get access to any updates live stream sessions and everything so you can prepare well and join us very well so this is how we open up with a week wednesday we're going to wrap up on this and let's see how week eight is going to go remember if you are sitting for the march 2024 examination we have five weeks to go technically five weeks technically to go the exam registration is opened today and will be closing on the 16th of february so make sure that you put yourself in the position plan yourself very well if you're going to sit for the exam make sure that you are making time to study well so you can position yourself to pass the examination i'll catch you same time on wednesday as we continue with our discussion stay safe and stay blessed